भी फिर से एक और मैसेज भेजूंगा ओके लाइव नाउ करके ना यस so it gives me you know, immense pleasure to uh, you know invite one of my good friends dr nikhil pradhan who is an excellent uh, surgeon and uh, who has uh, immense experience in total joint replacements it is a topic of vast interest that we are going to tackle today which is uh, the painful total knee replacement all of us have faced this issue uh, at some point in our practice or we will face as long as we continue to do the joint replacements the current thrust of all the innovations and the modalities of therapy is to decrease the percentage of the patients who have a painful uh, post operative period or a painful total knee replacement after they have had a surgery dr nikhil is currently working in the warrington and cheshire hospital near manchester and uh, he has trained at uh, jj km and sain hospitals in the country but then he has been to writington where he worked for a few years but currently he is the clinical lead and the md multidisciplinary team lead for uh, his hospitals in warrington what is more important he is also the national joint registry uh, lead for his area which gives him a sort of a i would should say a sneak preview or a sneak peek into the data that is coming up much before it is published and much before where it is going uh, in which way it is heading the national joint registry of england and wales as we know is a very robust uh, sort of registry which uh, warns us about adverse outcomes which warns us about revision rates of different prostheses and implants and it is a sort of a ever increasing and a ever uh, changing scenario so we really look forward to this very engrossing uh, afternoon and to listen from dr nikhil about uh, uh, assessing managing and how to go about a painful total knee replacement over to you nikhil welcome hello everyone um thanks ashish for the introduction i will uh, just about share my slides and then i'll start off okay so um right so it gives me really pleasure to share this forum with um, dr siddharth yadav dr ashish fadnis um, neeraj vijlani who are you know all very close friends and uh, i shall take you through this um, topic of painful total knee replacement it is a bit of my experience a bit of literature search and where we've come from what we find in the uk is that um, most of our medical legal problems most of the unhappy patients that we have it all tends to relate to that painful knee which seems to be ignored and pushed from pillar to post in terms of trying to find out what is the solution to my problem so if you look at the prevalence and if you compare hip replacements to knee replacements there's a wide range but what you'll find is that the chances of a patient having pain post surgery is more with a knee replacement than with a hip replacement and in some of the best quality studies that were um, looked at and reviewed in the bmj in 2012 they found that 9% of hip replacements might comp complain of some pain but 20% of knee replacements tend to complain co complain of pain which is unfavorable outcome to them and is creating problems and it also depends on when you ask this question so that this is an interesting point that if you look at this slide again from the bmj publication if you ask the question at 6 months you might find that the results are actually pretty good most patients will say that post surgery the pain is looking better but then when you ask that same question at 
two years, five years. And at five years, you might find that there are only about 65% of patients who say, I'm completely pain-free. There will be some who are uncertain, who might occasionally get pain. And there are about those 20% or 25% who say, actually, I do get pain. And purely because this is such a subjective question as to whether do you get pain, the answer can be quite variable. But what we do understand from this slide is that there is a significant number of patients who do get pain following a knee replacement. So let's go to the next slide. So looking at what is the impact of this pain for the patient? So the patient can have functional limitations in terms of stiffness in the knee, uh, leading to poor general health, need for strong opioids, leading to affecting their sleep pattern. They can then have psychological impact in terms of depression, stress, anxiety. And then there's that social element of well, and wherein they find that they are getting isolated, you know, can't go to work, can't carry on the work they have, and it tends to interfere with their relationships. So there's a wide impact of a painful knee on that patient. So once you get this patient and you want to analyze what's happening, it's worthwhile going into the history before this patient had a knee replacement. It is worthwhile looking at, did this patient have multiple previous surgeries prior to the knee replacement? Did this patient have some element of chronic pain elsewhere in the body? What's his general mental health status like? Does he have multiple comorbidities? Does he have pain in other areas of his body, such as his spine, et cetera? And sometimes it's worthwhile finding out or listening to the patient to say, how does he describe his pain? So if he describes his pain to the extent where he says that the pain is so bad, doctor, that you can chop my leg off, be careful because the chances are that there is more functional element to this than what he's just suggesting. So let us now try and understand what is pain, what is function. And I think what you'll find is that pain and function are distinct outcomes. And they really have different predictors. They can go at a different trajectory. And what we mean by this is you might have a patient who functionally seems to do quite well. The knee bends well. He's able to walk, but he has significant pain. So there's not, it's not necessary that you have a good correlation between pain and function. When you come to pain, you then look at two elements of pain. And they are completely distinct. Is it a nociceptive pain, wherein it is secondary to tissue damage? Or is it a neuropathic pain, which is somatosensory in its origin? And this will be important to identify as the treatment is different for both these pains. It is also important to look at, does this patient complain of rest pain? And does he have pain on movement? Again, these are two distinct pain dimensions, which will have underlying mechanisms that are different, and hence treatment is different. So I think it is important when you ask the question and when you're looking out for these patients and examining them, keep in mind pain, function, nociceptive, neuropathic, rest pain, pain on movement, and then analyze further. It is sometimes worthwhile to have some sort of a quantitative uh, figure to say, what is your pain? What is your pain score? What is your knee score? And yes, you can use the WOMAC, the Oxford knee score or the Coos score, and they will give you some idea, more so in terms of monitoring how your treatment is progressing. So yes, pain is very subjective and it is important to understand that, but to have a objective quantifiable value is useful when it comes to monitoring that pain. When you look at the etiology of a painful knee replacement, you can look at it different ways. One way is to look at it as biological versus surgical. Surgical could be infection, localized nerve injuries, 
loosening, malalignment, malrotation, oversizing, undersizing, stiffness, instability. Or you could look at it and look at the other causes such as biological, which is an inflammatory response, which could be inflammatory to the surgery, could be allergic, could be a seronegative arthropathy that's flaring up again. And then of course we look at CRPS and pain referred from the hip and the spine. Or you can look at this in terms of intrinsic and extrinsic. And intrinsic, extrinsic would be looking at hip pathologies, pain referred from the spine. One of the common ones which is missed is vascular. Look for DVT and vascular claudications. And then something specific in terms of pest ansar is bursitis, which we see a bit. Stress fractures, especially subtle stress fractures, various prosthetic fractures, tendinopathies, heterotrophic ossifications, psychological disorders, and then that sort of um, wider remit of um, PVNS, rheumatoid, seronegative arthropathies. When we come to intrinsic, which is probably what we understand better, we look at infection, which could be um, early postoperative. It could be a knee which is doing extremely well, has a massive hematogenous acute infection, and then has chronic pain, or it could just be late chronic infection. You can then look at instability, which is, um, you can look at mediolateral instability, flexion extension instability, instability which occurs only when the patient is going upstairs and hence in flexion and not an extension and anteroposterior instability. Malalignment, again, quite common and you need to look at multiple planes and rotational malalignment. Soft tissue impingement is a very subtle thing uh, picked up a lot by the physiotherapists uh, who examine these knees and um, you'll find that these patients have patellar clunks which are painful there can be fabular impingement, popliteus tendon impingement, and partly this could be all related to a component which is overhanging or it's oversized and hence causing these problems. And sometimes diagnostic injections, ultrasound guided, could be of help in these matters. Arthrofibrosis is a known cause. And then you've got wear osteolysis, aseptic loosening, Recurrent hemarthrosis uh, seen with PVNS quite commonly, and then extensive mechanism problems. Again, quite easily um, you forget to sort of look at patellar tracking, is it malaligned, and is that what is causing this patient pain? So if you were to look at the common causes that we um, normally see when we see a painful knee, infection, especially chronic low-grade infection, instability, patellofemoral problems, malalignment, incorrect sizing in terms of oversizing, overstuffing, undersizing, soft tissue impingement, um, very minor stress fractures, osteolysis, and periprosthetic loosening seems to be the most common sort of findings of a painful knee. So when you come to clinical examination, I think I shall not dwell into the details of how to hold a knee and how to examine it. But what I can tell you is that it is important to look at gait. So it is important that you walk, uh, you walk this patient up and down and see if there is a particular thrust that you can see in instability. It is quite interesting how many times you'll pick it up. Look for surgical scars. Look for um, what the skin is like. Um, depending upon the skin on the knee and the leg, CRPS, vascular disease can be easily picked up. So I always say that when you examine a knee, go back to your really pre um, sort of consultant days and think about how would you look at this knee, make sure you strip the patient down so that you can actually see the hip, knee and ankle and you can see the skin discoloration, make the patient walk. Look if that patient walks with his foot in external rotation or internal rotation, all of which will really give you a lot of information with regards to how you investigate this patient further. And there's no doubt that examination of a hip joint and the spine is quite crucial in um, assessing a painful knee. 
So let's come to the investigations. I think um, there's no doubt that x-rays is our gold standard. We always stick to that. But when you ask for x-rays, make sure you ask for long leg weight bearing x-rays so that they include the hip and the ankle. You get a good alignment, look for the lateral view and get a skyline view. The skyline view can um, give you a lot of subtlety about how the patella is riding onto that component and whether there is a squinting of the patella, um, which could be a telltale sign of uh, patellofemoral tracking problems. Is bone scan helpful? Um, more and more so in our sort of setup, we are um, now moving away from bone scan. A bone scan has a huge negative predictive value. And what that means is I would do a bone scan if I'm looking at a patient where I think this is more neuropathic, I don't see a definite cause from within the component, but I want to be safe, I'll do a bone scan, the bone scan comes cold, negative, and it rules out any inflammatory pathology within that knee. So it has, it has more relevance if it is negative. A hot bone, bone uh, scan is not specific of anything at all. So you got to be careful um, in how you look at a bone scan and how you, uh, how you interpret a bone scan. I think CD scan is uh, absolutely vital. We would do a CD scan on most of our uh, painful knees to look for, again, alignment, uh, rotational uh, problems, look at subtle periprosthetic fractures, especially if that knee is the femoral component is notching and you want to see if there is uh, any subtle fracture in that region. And then if you want to quantify the um, osteolysis under the femoral component and under the tibial tray. MR scans invariably throw a lot of artifacts and uh, despite newer MR scan machines, I think um, it is not an investigation of choice for us. SPECT scans seem to be uh, done at specific centers. And I think it depends on very user-dependent investigation, uh, extremely dependent on the interpretation of the reporting radiologist. And hence, you, you would uh, only do these uh, investigations if you are working with a particular radiologist who has a keen interest in SPECT scans and you can sort of correlate your findings with him. I think baseline investigations of full blood count, ESR and CRP, extremely useful, extremely useful for monitoring how your treatment is progressing. So um, I would recommend those if they are extremely high in terms of inflammatory markers, then infection um, is a possibility. If they are mid-range, inflammatory disease is uh, something that you can look at. Uh, the interleukin-6 uh, dip test, again, is useful. And um, again, if um, you know, it is something that your institute offers, then you could consider that. Once you've done these investigations, and if you cannot see an obvious cause, or you are thinking, is there an element of infection here, then an aspiration is not a bad idea. You could send the aspirate for a culture and sensitivity and for histology as well. And again, depending upon how the pathologist who's uh, looking at these uh, can report, you can get really good outcome results from histology. Um, we invariably deal with um, our um, knee investigations in an MDT. So we would include radiologist, microbiologist, and rheumatologist uh, in this sort of a problem. And many a times our rheumatologist will suggest that they would like a biopsy, in which case an arthroscopy and uh, a biopsy could be used as a diagnostic tool more than uh, anything else. So if you then look at treatment and you say, how do I take this treatment forward for this patient? Should I operate, should I not operate? Then I would say there are three things that I would always consider and I discuss with most of my juniors about how we take this forward. If you've got pain on movement, so it's related to function, if you can identify that this is nociceptive pain, if you can identify a cause, if you find 
that there, it, this patient was a low risk in terms of his primary surgery, then revision surgery will give you good outcomes. If you find that the pain is neuropathic, there is no identifiable structural cause, then I would suggest the non-operative treatment is the way forward. And the treatment of pain followed by physiotherapy will become multimodality, including pain management consultants who can then control the pain and the physiotherapist who can then work in terms of uh, getting the knee moving again. If you are heading for revision surgery without a cause, almost 80% chance that you'll end up with pain again. So uh, there's no recommendation for revision surgery if you cannot identify a cause. So to summarize, it is a difficult problem. Partly you need to spend some time to listen to this patient, to understand the problem. And sometimes just someone who sits and listens to you helps and helps the patient uh, in terms of how he relates to you and you build up a bond with that patient in terms of his treatment. Worthwhile involving the family as they are gonna be seeing this patient all the time at home. Look for an MDT and a holistic approach in terms of how we take this forward. And don't forget to look at identifying any preoperative uh, risk factors and revision surgery is only to be undertaken if you can identify a cause. If not, treat the patient with conservative management as your mainstay. Thank you. Ashish Siddharth, you want to come in on this? Yeah. Are we back on? Yeah. Yeah, very well summed up here, Nikhil. And uh, I think let's see if we have got any questions uh, coming in. So Neeraj will pass on those questions. But just to set the uh, ball rolling, I would like to ask. Uh, now this National Joint Registry, which is capturing more and more data. I mean, are you also capturing the data for uh, uh, revision data is being captured, if I am not mistaken? Yeah, but uh, are the causes for revision like aseptic loosening or infection, are they also being uh, seen at and then what does it show in uh, an average practice, the percentage of these patients where you don't find a, a particular reason? Yeah, so it's really interesting. And as you say, so on our form for revision surgery, we would have to take whether it is one state surgery or two state surgery, and there is then an indication for surgery. So in that indication of surgery, you would take, if you know that it is infection, um, periprosthetic fracture, aseptic loosening, and one of them is unexplained pain. And what we find is that initially we would see surgeons ticking that box of unexplained pain. And then when you looked at the outcome of that, you would end up finding that these patients are still in pain. So what we've realized is, and this is where I think looking at the NGR as a whole makes sense, is that the reason for surgery is now moving more towards anything that is structurally um, found within that patient, the most common being aseptic loosening. So aseptic loosening followed by instability seem to be the most common cause for revision surgery. And in terms of um, um, pain, which is unexplained, I think uh, we are getting to a stage where we now um, as a unit look at our patients and say, are we doing the right by operating on these patients who just have unexplained pain? Um, so yeah, I think uh, that's a good question in terms of uh, it's important to have that. And, uh, you know, with the advances in anesthesia, more and more surgeries are being done with a neuroaxial blockage or you use these blocks post-operative. Has uh, anything changed in terms of uh, acute pain turning into chronic pain or the pain sort of, you know, sticking in the pain that you used to get at a month's time, patient satisfaction translating into less pain post-op? Um, the way I would put it is that if you can have um, a pain-free perioperative period, then you will find that the patient has a good outcome in the long term. 
So if you allow the patient to have a lot of pain for the first 10 days by not giving him adequate analgesia, then you tend to struggle. So at least you uh, in, in the UK, and I know um, in the US it's slightly different, but in the UK we are more into uh, spinal anesthetics with uh, using uh, all the pain moralities that are possible to try and control that pain and then go ahead uh, rather than a GA with um, using pain modality. So um, either way, I think it is important that you control that pain during the perioperative period. And do you use these uh, uh, pain modulators like uh, pregabalin or uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories? So non -steroidal What has been said about those? And I think th these are the questions that appear frequently that whether you use Lyrica or pregabalin. Sure. So non-steroidals, we don't because they seem, seem to affect uh, the sort of uh, coagulation and everything else. So we are a bit careful on non-steroidals. pre uh, there is a school of thought which says that if you start with that and then use that during your perioperative period, it is useful, not only in terms of controlling pain, but also controlling the need for opioids. So if you put a patient on pre then the chances of needing opioids is less. Opioids do have other impact uh, on patients. So um, yes, our institute has not gone down that line. We did try it for a period of time, but um, it we weren't very successful in managing it. But again, I know of a neighboring institute which is very much into it and they would use it on a regular basis. Okay, excellent. Siddharth, you want to? Uh... Yeah, no, yes. So one more thing is uh, after this, uh, what I would like to know Nikhil's opinion. So after TKR, there is naturally there is a, uh, some synovitis, and some people they do have prolonged synovitis. So in that case, some anti-inflammatory of that kind is required. Some of the patients, and some uh, I've seen people stopping anti-inflammatory very early. And that also leads to delayed uh, recovery. So pain management actually is required till they get good range of motion during physiotherapy uh, up to six weeks. That is, uh, uh, what do you say about it? No, I think you're right, Siddharth. Um, one of the things we say to patients is don't be in a rush to come off your pain management tablets. Mm. Um, there is almost it sometimes is a race the patients almost want to come off their crutches very quickly get going very quickly come off then pain medication just because somebody else who had a knee replacement previously said to them that oh i managed this in you know two weeks so they are trying to have that race with that patient and i think it's really important to say that you know what forget about everything else it's you i'm your surgeon and between us what is important is the outcome at three months. We need to get you at three months into a position where you're absolutely fine, back to full activity. So if you do go in that fashion, then it works. But you're right. There's a ra in fact, there's a race between surgeons as well to have this thing about, oh, I got my patient you know, off crutches very quickly. It is only, I think it's all in your head. It doesn't really make any sense. Correct. Another point is uh, in some of the, we see a lot of diabetic patients in India and uh, I had terrible experience with the post-operative diabetic uh, amylotrophy, some of the patient, and those are really very painful for first three months. So in those cases, uh, uh, like I normally don't use Tonike and what is uh, your experience in uh, diabetic patients uh, and what is your cutoff for uh, HbA1c? Uh, Kindly, we would like to take your opinion. Yeah, I think for us, HbA1c is something that um, our anesthetists are very keen on as well. So the ideal would be to try and control the HbA1c before surgery to bring it down under seven if possible. Now, many times it's not possible. You can try your best, but it is just not possible for a patient to do that purely because Either he's got a diabetic management which doesn't work for him or the patient does not follow whatever you do. He just does not follow and he carries on taking on with sugars and everything else. 
so you can be very strict about it but i think a time comes when you say that am i going to operate on these patients and hence i say go, go back to those risk factors that i talked about if you are then going to operate on this patient then you'll have to tell this patient that the chances of you having some amount of pain post surgery is going to be higher your recovery is going to be slower and then take them on um what we we dealt with these patients especially we've got a huge problem with obesity and the diabetes in the uk as you well know and you know at the end of the day there is a balance most of them there is this argument about i can't get you know walk and so i can't exercise so i can't lose weight so should i operate on this patient and the second thought is that you know you operate on these patients you give them a painful knee and all it does is makes them makes it easier for them to get to the fridge and eat more so there is that balance but you know you can't deny that these patients are in significant preoperative pain and need the knee replacement so as long as you explain all on that to the patient don't make your decision to operate at the first visit but you know take a couple of consultations before you say yes to that surgery i think you are okay they are a difficult problem though and uh, one more uh, question is there in many part in our country uh, surgeons are doing very early you know tkr in very early way and it has been documented if it is bone or not bone on bone then the outcome is poor and almost dissatisfaction rate is up to 40% so uh, what is your advice to our our surgeons here i think um, it is it is a big problem if you are operating on patients who do not have significant pain who do not have a bone on bone structural sort of uh, problem because if you are operating on them uh, early you have to understand that knee replacement is a mechanical joint you know and a mechanical joint will give you some amount of um, what i call as clunking or occasional aches and pains so if you are converting a patient who's got just minimal pain with hardly any risk of uh, you know that progressing into a knee replacement i think you're doing a big disservice to that patient um, i would definitely say you shouldn't be operating on these patients yeah yeah so uh, regarding same uh, uh, there's one patient uh, we can do one case presentation and okay. then a message out of it come so uh, neeraj can i share one okay. yeah you can share the screen yeah so uh, so this is a uh, i think 8 years back uh, so uh, this she was 8 years back in 2012 i did this tkr she was 54 years old and uh, obese and she was having pain for 5 years and significant amount of six leg extension deformity and she was seeing a rheumatologist for quite some time uh, although her inflammatory markers were normal so then uh, after going to rheumatologist he said uh, he sent that patient to me to do arthroscopic biopsy and uh, uh, we did arthroscopic biopsy and uh, nothing came out but it was severely damaged cartilage both tibial and femoral and we take we took couple of pictures and uh, i discussed with rheumatologist he said now uh, the histopath was normal so he said nothing can be done and uh, patient is very painful so the total knee replacement is the only answer so go ahead for that so then uh, i think after 5 6 weeks i did her tkr on uh, this left side and uh, after that she was fine but uh, after 8 weeks she developed extension lag and uh, flexion did not go beyond 80 degree so first thing we thought is infection we did crp negative all kind of there no improvement for 12 weeks then after 6 months still same, same problem flexion deformity then we uh, did the pet scan and uh, everything and which is negative 
so infection was ruled out and i took multiple opinion also and they say nothing can be done then after one year she came back and her fixed flexion deformity it uh, it became 20 degree and flexion was just 45 degree so she has deteriorated very badly in one year so uh, everything is tried and nothing could be done so finally uh, we decided to go for arthroscopic adhesiolysis and uh, in that with my my colleague he did uh, supra patella adhesiolysis and then we put again epidural and uh, ppm fortunately the fixed flexion deformity it became 5 degree and we could get flexion up to 95 degree so it is just going on for one year then uh, uh, she was all right and uh, she was uh, following up last for i think 3 years and i think last year also she came so still the knee is surviving for last 8 years but initially i think first uh, one year one and a half years she gave terrible time coming to clinic every 8 days 10 days stiffness pain so what we learned uh, uh, what i learned from this is if you see uh, the first uh, tkr was done very early i mean it is just 5 weeks after uh, arthroscopy that was one uh, cause for uh, arthrofibrosis and also if you see the k x ray it's not uh, it's early osteoarthritis although we can we could prove by arthroscopy there is no cartilage but if you see the x ray still some space is there and third thing manipulation uh, i tried after 3 months so this is the case although 8 years back but uh, surgery tkr going uh, within 5 to 6 weeks after surgery uh, then early oa tkr in early t and late manipulation so these are the three things uh, that i learned and uh, that message and same thing probably will take your opinion about it uh dr nikhil what do you say about it? ashish what do you think is there anything you want to add i agree, agree it is it is quite early 5 weeks and this kind of x ray you know uh, it is surprising that she even agreed to undergo a knee replacement with the presence of so many other orthopedic surgeons around who would have you know happily op offered her a hto or a uni or whatever <laughs> But Ashish, yeah. this was uh, yeah, it was long time back, eight uh, eight years back, and uh, I think she was going to rheumatologist for quite some time, right. and uh, and he was also probably fed up, and he said, "I nothing will work," uh, and uh, so yeah. uh, so that, no, the I, thing. I mean, uh, I have sort of you know reconciled to the fact. So there have been a lot of publications also about uh, the preoperative uh, dependence on uh, opioids. Uh, and giving a bad outcome post op pre operative dependence on nsaids and giving a bad outcome post op uh, along with the factor that you know she is a early osteoarthritic so when i had started observing uh, our own sort of you know data set that this patient has been waiting for 2 3 years and every day she is eating uh, tramadol or uh, some opioid analgesic then it's basically bad news you need to work really hard with them and i think let the patient demand a knee replacement rather than us uh, selling one because uh, the other thing that happens uh, not uncommonly is also uh, as dr nikhil said comparison between uh, two patients and it is very common for them to uh, go out in the community and the physiotherapist to pass a pass a comment that oh you know uh, it's a bit late i think for 6 weeks you know you should have been doing this much you should have been doing you know that much so yes these radiologically good looking and where the surgeon can't find a cause are uh, the knees which specifically are our concern in this i day. think the other thing to remember when you do a knee replacement in a patient who's got any sort of inflammatory um, arthritis is that uh, the inflammatory arthritic process is coming from the capsule and the synovium which in a knee replacement you are not replacing so you got to warn the patient that if you get a flare up of that arthritis then it might be a problem and hence they got to be aware that we've had patients where we've done surgery and then you end up with a knee that is very much like you say swollen there's a bit of flexion deformity but when you actually examine them and you roll it they don't have effusion they have more synovitis 
and it does help in involving a rheumatologist at that point they can sometimes go on aggressive sort of treatments such as methotrexate and you might have to go in and do a synovectomy um what you say in terms of uh, arthrofibrosis sort of release that as well and surprisingly get very good results but uh, they are difficult problems they are me as 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 ashish and you have both rightly pointed out um, the management of this patient you know is early you are going in very early with surgery for this patient but there is an inflammatory element involved as well right so yeah sorry you have more cases yeah uh, we can go so this is a uh, next is i think we can go for instability uh, now she came uh, tkr was done elsewhere and uh, but all of sudden she said it became painful and she there was a clicking sound and uh, <clears throat> uh, on examination she had significant laxity medial lateral and if you see and uh, so these are the x ray if you see and uh, so basically she has a hyper extension is extension instability as medial lateral as well this right side was more symptomatic although in if you see in the video both were in hyper extension and see the skyline right side uh, severe patellar tilt and left side is a lot of atrophic ossification also now uh, our uh, inflam this uh, infection work up was negative then uh, this is a weight bearing x ray uh intrap also to more unstable so because of uh, i think she had this residual hyper extension and this ps knee uh, they cannot take it she had this probably the fracture of the tibial post and then after that it became very painful and she came to me so it was then i have to revise it and uh, uh, that's uh, it's uh, not so difficult i use a ckk with the distal augment and metavagal sleeve to bone defect but the message what i the takeaway home message is because she was unstable from beginning and uh, and probably there, there is a mild rotation component also and uh, that the post tibial post got fractured and that well, that's why she came to us so this is the case of instability and it was painful from beginning but she could tolerate it but uh, after the tibial post fracture it became unbearable and she has to undergo uh, for second surgery Yeah, can you go back to the thing? I mean, the only uh, the other thing I would like to highlight here. Uh, that's fine. I mean, the post-op uh, scan is fine. Is uh, probably the surgeon has tried to uh, compensate his lack of um, balancing with the uh, uh, poly. You know, either if it is a PS or a PS plus. A lot of times we see that you know if the surgeons are not able to achieve a balance. then they use tend to use a thicker poly or a highly constrained poly but what the sort of uh, they should realize is that a poly is not a substitute for your ligament balancing you know i think that probably could have happened because in, even in the initial post op x ray you can see that there is a unequal gap between the lateral and the medial side on a standing x ray or a supine x ray and this should sort of start to uh, worry them so do you think that you know he could have balanced them better by uh, doing a better release and a uh, she probably could have avoided this revision yeah i think there is no doubt in um, this pa patient the um, initial surgery um, was um, not adequate in terms of balancing of soft tissue neither there is no doubt you can see it in the terms of uh, hyper extension that the patient has 
um, all of those telltale signs that you see there on the post-operative x-ray, they're all suggestive that it's an uh, not a balanced knee. In fact, I think this is almost global instability. You've got medial lateral and anterior posterior instability. Um, and as Ashish has rightly pointed out, that has probably uh, been contributory to the fact that you ended up with a fracture of the poly. But uh, it is not the poly to be blamed. It is the fact that the knee was not stabilized. Um, and, you know, Siddhartha has done a fantastic job with um, what he's achieved post-operatively. Uh, that, those are difficult problems to deal with. So basically, it's a technical failure from primary. If you see the patella is also uh, almost tilting out, so probably femoral component is also mal rotated and uh, also and uh, as ashi is uh, rightly pointed out and so now sometime in primary many surgeons they are using constrained poly you know uh, in some of the although it's not recommended but i have seen couple of them and so uh, i probably that will not solve this problem if needs unstable from uh, on table uh, just putting a constrained poly it will not help and eventually, uh, this uh, they will get this kind of fracture. Because you see, I mean, uh, you see, it's hyperextending, and you have a very good range of uh, flexion even on table. You know, so uh, I also wonder what is the size of poly that you took out. So possibly he has gone all the way high, and then still not been able to. Buy. I mean, this poly, whether it's a 15 poly or a 19 poly, will be interesting to uh, see. Or whether he has just put a size 10 poly. In that case, probably he could have gone higher up. Maybe you could have balanced it a bit better, you know? Yeah. So that should also be kept in mind by uh, the surgeons when they are doing uh, the primary in the first place. Correct. correct. And also these uh, PS knee, uh, once uh, the cruciate is not there, uh, the extension, they, this this mechanism, I don't think PS can protect them in hyper extension. So they should keep some kind of, uh, they should air. Uh, some uh, on the flexion, they should keep knee in some kind of flexion deformity rather than achieving hyperextension or neutral. Yeah. That is probably another. Correct. So yeah. while we are dwelling on this, uh, you know, uh, Nikhil, I know for uh, certain that uh, you have sort of dabbled with uh, 3D printing, uh, eye assist, uh, computer navigation. Is there a sort of, and now uh, with the robotics coming in and uh, the push, from the industry uh, is such great. So is there a correlation in the in the technology that the patient has chosen and his sense of well-being that, you know, because I've used the navigation, therefore uh, my knee is better? Or is there some sort of confidence that the technology gives a uh, surgeon? I, you know, almost in every surgery, there is going to be an overlay of um, that uh, sort of uh, understanding between the patient and the surgeon. So there's no doubt that uh, the surgeon will try and compensate uh, by saying that I'm using this technology and the technology is going to sort things out. I think uh, where I come a bit differently is that I, I look at technology and say technology is good. I think uh, improving technology in terms of uh, whether it is navigation, robotics, um, ISS knees or whatever you're going at, the most important thing here is that you should be able to use that navigation tool to make what you want correct, correct. You cannot make the navigation do it for you. It doesn't work the other way around. The navigation is not going to suddenly make you a fantastic surgeon. What is going to happen is that if you are um, doing your surgery well, then there is some amount of human error in how good you can be. You might be the most experienced of surgeons, but there will be some amount of human error. And what navigation does is that if used correctly, then you can improve that on that outcome. So if your chance, as most studies have shown, that in a knee replacement, you can get it right about 80 to 85% of the times in terms of alignment. With navigation, you can improve that to 90%. What we've not got is soft tissue balancing. So maybe if you use navigation or robotics the right way, maybe you can get soft tissue balancing better. But the initial part of it 
that is crucial is the surgeon needs to know how to do his surgery and he needs to know how to use navigation to his benefit just because you have navigation with you it does not mean that you will do better that is that one aspect of the answer and the other aspect ashish as you rightly mentioned is that uh, the patient is looking at it and thinking this person is using navigation so i'm going to get a good outcome so the initial outcome for the first 3 months or 6 months is going to be fantastic and that bmj paper has almost shown you that you know it has shown that if you ask that question very early on the patient almost feel i've paid so much for it i've used navigation i've used robotics i'm going to be good this is going to be fantastic but you ask the question 3 years down the line 5 years down the line the truth will eventually come out and they'll tell you that actually no you know my knee still hurts so uh, you know prof robleski whom i worked with in writing turn is to always say that the worst thing for a surgeon is follow up <laughs> you know a good follow up it will bring all your uh, you know arrogance and everything down and you'll learn humility if you have good follow up and he was so true so i come back to this uh, navigation and robotic thing uh, last time i think we met you were mentioning that uh, zimmer is uh, pushing a robot and you are a part of uh, evaluating that so uh, i mean what does the current status of literature which is already published uh, have to say about the alignment outcomes or let's say the early outcomes following a knee replacement for the you know because it's coming here uh, everyone's wanting to buy a robot and the race is going on here as well so just like to hear from you so i think um, for us in the uk we are a bit more conservative than most of the world so if you look at robotics it is more in the us uh, very little in the uk um, the robotic industry for us uh, even in navigation all we look at it is to say can we get it better but that's about it i don't think we are using it especially because we are more of an nhs driven sort of setup where whether we use navigation or not it does not affect how the number of patients we do or uh, what sort of income revenue we generate so to some extent i don't think we in the uk can use it as a marketing tool so where we come from it is we say can this give me any additional information and right now we are struggling to answer that question all we find is that it allows you to make your mechanical alignment better mm-hmm. does improving your mechanical alignment translate into better function now that is a different question because we've all seen the worst aligned knees doing fantastically well having a wonderful outcome so all i can say is that what is your philosophy i always say that when you're looking at you know i i sort of use the i assist because purely i find it extremely um, user friendly and the least in terms of interference in your surgical sort of uh, procedure it's not a huge bulky thing i say what is your philosophy if your philosophy is kinematic alignment if you want to have 3 degree of virus in the tibia then navigation allows you to fine tune that and get to that 3 degree if that's what your aim is it cannot then translate you can't translate that and say because i've done that i'll have a good outcome so you need to understand your philosophy and use that navigation tool correctly to achieve that philosophy and that's where it stops in terms of robotics i think in the uk um, and i think you will see that in a post now is that robotics is going to take a big hit i think it probably i'll be surprised if it kicks off in the uk at all because the corona virus has changed everything for us so now that uh, you know our surgical time has already doubled with uh, the donning on and the donning off and everything else if you then are going to add a robotic machine to this equation um i can't see that coming in so the next me in fact we were just discussing that on our uh, Uh, forum that we sort of are because we are very I'm very much into the uh, Zimmer robotic arm to see where we are going with it and um, you know I can't see how it's going to go forward in the next uh, three to five years so um, it's really interesting um, so I mean I I'm pretty certain that if you want to use the robotic day in India most companies will throw it in for you. 
at a very cheap cost because most of the Western world, they won't be able to sell anything out here because of the virus right now. Already the India, there are, I think 20, 20 or more <laughs> robots are there. Uh, but I think it's all marketing gimmicks. People, I think most of, many of them, they are not using because when they are using, uh, they are saying 20, 30 knees per day. I don't think practically it's possible to do a robotic 20, 25 knees in a day. Uh, sure. Ashish, uh, I want to ask one um, question so, somebody sent me uh, regarding to Nikhil about managing, how do you manage neuroma, uh, post-operative neuroma around the knee following TKR, especially infrapatellar branch of Cephnus now or p now, neuromas. Uh, what is your experience, uh, neuroma, post-operative TKR, and how do you manage? The last question. Somebody send me a question. Uh, for us, Siddharth, um, for a neuroma, we are very much based on ultrasound management. So we will, uh, we've got very good ultrasound, uh, what we call as MSK ultrasound. They are musculoskeletal radiologists. And if we identify that problem, we'll try and treat it uh, with an ultrasound guided injection first as a diagnostic tool. So they'll inject a local anesthetic in that area and see if you get a relief. And if you get a relief, then uh, literally in the same sitting, they'll in about five, 10 minutes time later, they'll inject um, uh, a steroid to try and uh, achieve some sort of uh, better outcome. It is only if at the end of, uh, you know, two or three of these injections over a period of three or four years, if you're not still satisfied with the outcome, that any form of um, surgical treatment is uh, done. In fact, I can't remember having gone in to operate on a neuroma for uh, knee replacements. Right. Uh, any question, Ashish? Yeah, so basically, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Nikhil also looks after the MD, he's a MDT lead also. So Nikhil, can you just, uh, you know, sort of uh, tell us about what this, uh, M how the MDT sort of gets involved uh, when it's regarding a painful uh, knee in this scenario? Is there a role for the MDT and uh, how to go about things? So the way we run our MDT, as you can, so it is all a process, uh, the MDT more, uh, so initially the first time we started our MDT was uh, right when I started as a consultant, which is, you know, sometime back, almost you're going almost 15, 19 years back. So the idea was that most of our revision surgeries, which were complex, we would take a second opinion and then go ahead with surgery. So that was the initial start to say that, okay, I'm going to do this really complex revision. I need to have a second opinion. That's where it started. So it started with um, me and a colleague of mine, both interested in revision surgery, looking at it together. That then progressed to say, you know what, we're doing this complex revision, but it's an infected revision. I need a radiologist involved. So then you get a, one radiologist involved. Then you get the microbiologist involved. Now, gradually, with the introduction of the NJR, with the National Joint Registry, it's almost become mandatory for us to have an MDT for revision surgery. And the reason for that is that if you find that your revision rate is high, so if you say that you know more than 10% of your uh, primaries are being revised um, on a regular basis, then the NJR writes back to your primary hospital to say that you've got an outlier and they plot a, a sort of a funnel graph and within, and it's, there's a lot of leeway in that funnel graph. So it's not a very strict funnel graph, but it does show that there is, this person is an outlier and it is not a finger pointing exercise though. When we started off with this, it did look like that, you know, almost anyone who was sort of called an outlier. Deviation, yeah. Absolutely. We felt that, you know, my God, this is ridiculous. Are they going to stop me operating? And it was really bad. But actually it wasn't. It was an exercise where you would then sit down and say, what is the problem? Why am I getting a revision? Am I getting more revisions because I'm letting more of my juniors operate? Am I getting a revision because I'm cementing with uh, inadequate cementing techniques? And, you know, that is an interesting problem. 
um, I can talk on that in detail actually about uh, how to cement and how we've learned how to cement. Um, and um, so coming back to your question, Ashish, now our MDT involves all lower limb surgeons, whether you're a primary or a revision. It involves three radiologists and it involves a microbiologist. All our, We have three physiotherapists to attend that as well. And we have what we call as uh, uh, surgical practitioners who do a lot of our follow-up clinics for us. So they attend that. So it is quite a robust thing, um, which is uh, really, really useful in not only um, getting an answer of how to treat that patient, but when things go wrong, you've got a backup to say, I did the MDT, this is the reason why I operated. And you know, it, 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 is, it is a very robust system. Yeah, works very well. I think we should try that. I think it is worthwhile and I can give yeah. you a small uh, tip on where we found out. So one of our surgeons who is a very senior surgeon, uh, you know, what we call as now we have become very specialist in whatever we do, but we had generalist at that time. So everybody used to do everything. And during his days, the way he was taught to cement was simply to put cement on the T-bill tray, nothing on the keel and bang it down. And he had fantastic results. But then what happened is, as and when his trainees came in and he started saying to them, just put it on the T-bill tray, they didn't have the experience that he had. They ended up putting implants which are not adequately cemented. And he ended up having a couple of years when his revision rate was suddenly high. Now, luckily for us, the NGR picks it up and it feeds back very quickly. So as soon as it feeds back, saying that you are getting a higher revision rate, we looked at it and all we could find was most patients where he was not the primary surgeon, you had this problem. Now, he was scrubbed, but he was not the primary surgeon. And that makes a difference in the sense that, you know, if you're not hands-on with that procedure, you can get that cementing, which is not adequate. And he had loosenings. So we then changed the procedure. And, you know, he is now taken up on cementing the keel. And the post-op x-rays have started looking different. Now, hopefully that translates into not seeing the same amount of loosening. So I think that NJR, which initially was a big scare for us in terms of, you know, somebody's the big brothers looking at you from the top and we'll tell you off. I think there are positives to it. Um, there are subtle negatives to it. Uh, one of the negatives is that um, I think the NGR has sorted it out in the last couple of years. Uh, patella resurfacing was considered as a revision. So a lot of primary knee surgeons did not resurface the patella. But then this patient would go to somebody else and that person would revise the patella. That was taken as a revision, which had a decremental sort of outcome. That surgeon then becomes an outlier. So now the NGR is calling that as a different procedure. It's saying, you know, this is a different procedure if you're dealing with it. So it, there are, there's a learning point of the NGR. There's a learning point of the MDT. Um, but um, yeah, they're extremely useful tools. Excellent. So I think uh, we are close to our time, isn't it, Siddharth? Yeah, I think. Any Great. Other questions coming up? Uh... Uh, in general, uh, somebody sent me, is any difference in post-op uh, pain if a surgeon using tunique and without tunique? Because... Uh... I think so. I'm a, I, I'm a low tunique user. I use my tunique only when I'm cementing and that's the only time I use it. So I think there is a definite advantage in terms of pain relief in the short term, but in terms of the long term, it's not going to change anything. Um, what we find even with arthroscopies is that uh, the tunique causes inhibition of the quads, which means that your post-op recovery of the quads is slower, um, but that doesn't mean the quads doesn't come back. So if you look at the outcome in three to six months time, probably no difference, but in terms of immediate pain relief, um, need for opiates in the immediate post-operative period, there's a definite advantage in not using the tunic. 
Okay. So you want to conclude, Siddharth? Yeah, Ashish, conclude, please. No, no, I, I was asking if you want to make the concluding remarks. Oh, I was searching for <laughs> any answer. You, Bombay. Uh, Anna, uh, I thank you, uh, Dr. Nikhil, and also Dr. Sanjay Dhar, who has taken lead, and for last, I think, more than a month, he has organized, uh, for last two months, many webinars and uh, across the world. And uh, hopefully, we'll continue to do it, even after COVID. <laughs> So thank you very much. Thank you, Neeraj and uh, Ashok Sham. They are doing wonderful. They are doing almost 10 webinars every day. And uh, th thank you, Neeraj. Thanks, Satish. Thank you, everyone. Siddhar, so uh, we let's announce the next week's webinar. Next week, we have Dr. Somyajit Basu from Kolkata. He is going to be talking on primary tumors of the spine, which I know all the three of you are not interested in that topic. But we have other panelists from Navi Mumbai joining in with Dr. Agu Prasad Varma and uh, Dr. Agni Veshtiku. Thank you, Nikhil. Thank you for sparing your time. And bye-bye to everyone oh, on the TV. Thank you.